Hello there, I am Zalerla, and this is the Joy of Computer Gaming, where we investigate good and intriguing examples of computer gaming history. Today's highlighted game is Ultima 3 Exodus. The wander the world while whooping wyverns with your warriors, whisking your watercraft into a whirlpool, and working wondrous cards into a wrathful wicked wizard's workstation game. It's a tiled-based role-playing game by Origin Systems, originally released for the Apple II in 1983, and then later for the Atari 8-bit, the version I played, Commodore 64, MS-DOS, Atari ST, Amiga, Macintosh, two different versions even, PC-88, PC-98, NES, MSX, Sharp X1, FM7, FM Towns, and fan ports were also made for the Game Boy Palm OS and even an alpha for the Sega Master System. This is the first good role-playing game that I played as a kid. Some people may recall that my first episode was another good RPG, Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, but I didn't play that until after Ultima 3. Ultima 3 took the basics from Ultima 1 and Ultima 2, added in a full party instead of solo play, loads of additional details, tactical combat, and has a complete unique soundtrack, quite possibly the first game to have done so. Most of the game is done in tiles with an overhead view, with text for the details of the game. Unlike previous Ultima games, there are some solid bars separating the text regions, the player stats, and the overhead view, which gives it a more complete and professional look. The characters, monsters, and objects are largely monochrome, with occasional artifacting to show green or red, or orange or blue on some screens. Almost every creature has two frames of animation that simply alternate every few frames, and there is flowing water and lava. In dungeons, the graphics are really simple. Solid color walls, bright white doorways, white rectangles for boxes, and simple lines for ladders. When you run into a hot rod or a fountain, simple tile-based images appear. The problem with the way the Atari 8-bit's artifacting worked is that it made the text a bit hard to read. It's more exaggerated in the emulators than on the real Atari, but it was still a bit of a problem nonetheless. If you played on a monitor instead of a television, the game was monochrome with lots of lines instead of colors, but it was a lot easier to read. From the depths of hell, he comes for vengeance! The game supposedly takes place 20 years after Ultima 2, though since Ultima 2 involves time travel on Earth, we don't know relative to which time period or how Earth ended up being involved at all. Minax left behind something sinister, an unknown thing of evil. A new island rose out of the sea with a giant serpent protecting a sinister castle in the center of it. Nobody even knows what the evil actually is or even knew its name until a derelict ship appeared with the word Exodus written on the deck in blood. Monsters have begun appearing again, and this time Lord British is calling a group of adventurers to deal with what the manual calls a siege perilous multiple times. In short, there's a big bet out there, and now you can use up to four characters to deal with it. Figuring it all out is part of the game. Why the evil entity has the name of Exodus, a word that means a long trek or journey usually involving a large amount of people, is anybody's guess. Maybe Ultima Trek didn't quite have the same ring to it. Ultima 3 was not strapped for commands, that's for sure. Every single letter is used for a different command, with additional commands being typed after pressing O for other. Like Ultima 2, Z is used to look at the stats of one of your characters, though you have to press enter over and over to slowly scroll through the list or escape to exit it early. I wish it went to a full screen list like Ultima 2 did so it was easier to look over a character's data, though Ultima 2's stats were quite a mess come to think of it. You will use the spacebar to pass quite a bit, like waiting for the moon gates. Movement is done with the arrow keys, though unlike other Atari games, you only press the keys to move instead of pressing control with them, so in emulators you may need to map the keys a bit different to use them, otherwise you have to use strange keys for moving around. When dealing with weapons, armor, and spells, you use letters for them. These are listed on the card as well, but it takes some getting used to. I learned it all as a child so it makes sense to me, but I can see how this would be confusing to anybody else. It's not like the game gives you any menus at all to choose from, which would have been helpful. And if you're not doing anything for a few seconds, the game automatically passes a turn. The game is only paused when waiting for other prompts, such as casting a spell or looking at your stats. This automatic passing also happens in combat, so be decisive. The Overland World is a 64x64 64 64 map that wraps around both north to south and east to west, which means it's some sort of tour shape. The game even takes advantage of this style of wraparound and has a landmass that connects the northwest and southeast corners through the wraparound. There is a large hidden valley and lake near the center of the map that you could only reach with a moon gate or a teleport, as well as a secluded dungeon, a pass through between two moon gates, and the final castle, Exodus, blocked off behind the Great Serpent. There's also a whirlpool in the sea that moves around constantly, even when nothing else is moving. There are only two castles in the world, Lord British's castle and Exodus's castle. There are ten cities, two on islands, one in the hidden valley, and one that only appears when the moons are both new in the middle of the forest, making it almost impossible to find without hints in the game. And in the Atari 8-bit version, there are six dungeons, though a seventh superfluous dungeon exists in all other versions of the game. 
The dungeons are all 8 levels deep, with each level a 16x16 16 16 map of solid spaces which wrap around. Unlike the previous Ultima games, you must go to the dungeons to complete the game. Here you will find treasure, sometimes an awful lot of it, healing and curing fountains, as well as hot irons that will give you the four marks you need in the game, kings, fire, force, and snakes. You'll also fight lots of enemies, which are more powerful the lower you go into the dungeon, deal with traps, poisonous fountains, and gremlins which steal 100 food from one character each time you run into one. Oh yeah, and the ever so much fun winds, which remove any light spell or torch you have in use at the time. And since there are secret doors and lots of twists and turns, and you appear in a random tile if you teleport up or down a level, it's quite easy to get lost in them, even with maps readily available. Every city and castle is also a 64x64 map, which does not wrap around, each unlike the other. However, aside from shops, there's little point to going to most of the cities, especially once you know everything you need to know to win the game. If you're still learning how to complete the game, you'll spend a lot of time in each town, talking to every NPC to try to get hints about it. However, Dawn, the hidden city, offers the best weapons and armor available in the game for sale, though for an exorbitant price. You'll visit Lord British's castle a few times to level up your characters. Exodus's castle is where you go to complete the game, so generally you only need to go there once. The final location in the game is Ambrosia, the Underworld. It also works like a city location, with its own 64x64 map, except you reach it by being on a ship and going into the Whirlpool. You can only leave it by ascertaining another ship and sending it through a static Whirlpool. You learn through the course of the game what this unique location is for. Outside of dungeons, you may also encounter lava, which hurts your characters for 50 damage at a time, and force fields, which hurt your first living character for 100 damage and prevent you from entering. The Mark of Fire lets you go safely through lava. Heck, you can even swim in this stuff with it. The Mark of Fire lets you go through force fields as if they weren't even there. Time is a strange thing in this game as you travel. When you're on the main world map, poison hurts you every step, your magic points regenerate every step, and you lose one food every 11 steps. Everywhere else, this happens at a 1 4th rate, so it takes 4 steps to regenerate a point of magic and 44 steps to lose one food. This really doesn't match the sizes, where a city is zoomed in at 64 times the overworld, but time acts like it's only 4 times, so you effectively travel on the main world map at 16 times the speed of inside of a city. Old games, right? The game is played with 1-4 to four characters. I don't think it mentions it in the manual, but when you form a party, choose 0-0 for a party member to complete your party with fewer characters. You create characters by choosing a name, sex, race, type, which is the class, and filling in the stats. The frustrating part about this screen is there's no backspace, and it resets whenever you make a mistake, such as setting a stat lower than 5 or higher than 25. For sex, you can pick male, female, or other, and it makes no difference at all in the game. There are five races available for each character. Human, Elf, Dwarf, Bobbit, and Fuzzy. The Bobbit is actually a Hobbit, but they wanted to make a unique letter for each race, and since we need H to be human, Hobbits became Bobbits. Bobbits don't exist in any other Ultima game, so far as I'm aware. Another unique race here is the Fuzzy, which also doesn't exist in any other Ultima game. Looking at their artwork and the rulebook, they don't really look like anything in particular, though the later Lemmings characters remind me of them. They are possibly based on the Fuzzies from the book Little Fuzzy by H. Beam Piper. The race of a character controls their maximum stats. The types or classes are essentially Fighter, Thief, Mage, and Cleric, and most combinations thereof. The combo classes only get half the Thief, Mage, or Cleric abilities, whereas Fighter combo classes are the same as Fighters, except where there are strict equipment restrictions. Fighters just fight. You want 50 decks and the highest strength possible, so of course you'll pick a dwarf for them. Thieves want decks as high as possible so you can avoid the most traps and a high strength to do more damage. Wizards get your intelligence as spell points for casting spells, whereas clerics get your wisdom as spell points. Both should have a 50 decks and as high a strength as you can get. For example, rangers, which are all four classes, are the most versatile class, but they also want every stat high, so I recommend making them human to have the best spread. However, they are never as good at traps or stealing as a thief, and they only get half the lowest stat between intelligence and wisdom for spell points. Your stats are how powerful your characters are. They start from 5 to 25, and you have 50 points to distribute in the beginning. Strength governs how much damage you do with weapons, and this covers a huge range. Fighting with a character with only a 5 strength takes a long time, even though I'm hitting every time. Look how long it takes to take out these three thieves. About 45 seconds. With a 75 strength and the exact same equipment, I can wipe out a full party of 8 thieves in about 15 seconds. Dexterity controls how well you hit, as well as how well your character can disarm traps and steal. For hitting, you only need to reach a dex of 50, and then you'll never miss again. For thief types, you want your dex as high as possible to avoid more traps. Intelligence and Wisdom simply control how many magic points wizards and clerics get respectively. Full wizards get intelligence spell points, whereas half wizards only get half intelligence for their spell points. The same goes for clerics and half clerics with wisdom. 
Rangers get half of the lower of intelligence and wisdom, and Druids get half of the greater of intelligence or wisdom. There's no point in raising these stats for characters that do not need the spell points. Normal attacks are the best way to fight in the game, and you definitely want to do that at a range. Characters that can use bows are the best for playing the game with, so I usually make teams of fighter types, like a fighter, ranger, lark, and paladin. The purely mage types, such as illusionist, alchemist, and druids, are pretty much useless, since they don't even get the higher level spells, and they're awful in combat. Pure mages aren't much better, because most of the spells aren't that great, and they can only use daggers at a range. For spells, they cost 0 to 75 spell points to cast. Since you only get half intelligence or wisdom on combination characters, even with a 99 in the respective stat, the most spell points you can have is 49 on these characters, so you're missing out on the highest 6 spells, which is why the game calls them the advanced spells. However, they're pretty much not worth having a wizard or cleric around for, since aside from Sir Mondum, which resurrects a character, they are not very helpful. The spells are worth looking at for a bit, well, particularly the free ones. Wizards get a free spell named Repond, which may be cast once per battle and will attempt to destroy all orc-type monsters you are fighting. It has a high failure rate, however. Clerics get a similar spell, Pontori, which is the same thing but for skeleton-type monsters. The 10-cost Cleric spell is your basic healing spell, which you'll use like crazy. Once you get to 35 spell points, the Cleric can also cure poison, which isn't very important since a curing poison fountain is literally 5 steps into the Dungeon of Fire, and poison only kills you very slowly, one point of health at a time. The rest of the spells are things like light, open a chest, which can fail, move up or down a level in the dungeon, and so on. There are various attack spells for wizards, and the useless 45 cost allow you to cast a cleric spell with your remaining spell points spell. The 40 cost Sekutu for clerics does let you immediately leave a dungeon, which is rather handy, so maybe get a Bobbit Paladin for that? In the high range of wizard and cleric spells, we don't gain much. For wizards, it's hit all of the enemies, kill a single enemy, negate time, which a 90 gold item can do, Another hit all the enemies, set all enemies health to 1, and an instant kill a random number of enemies spell. On the cleric side, it's even worse. A greater heal that heals about 4 times as much as the low level one and costs 5 times as much spell points. A vision of a map, which a 75 gold item can do. Kill a single enemy, resurrect, instant kill a random number of enemies, and raise from ashes, which permanently also loses 5 wisdom. As far as ashes go, I've never seen a character turn into ash. I've tried burning them in lava and dying in various ways. Supposedly a dragon can cause it, but you have to be playing all wrong to be dying in the first place except in the very early game. These spells are almost useless because of how powerful your fighters get in combat with some strength and a 50 dex. This is pretty much how all battles go once you get your stats up. You see enemies, press A and up for most characters, and everything dies in one or two hits. Of course you might press the wrong direction for one attack and add a second or two to the battle, except where is that shock going? In any case, battles rarely take over 20 seconds and your enemies don't even stand a chance. Some battles, like against this lone mana war, are over so quickly the music doesn't even get to start. And mana wars reward the most experience in the game, 20 for each one you kill, so you know they're not pushovers. Who cares if a wizard or cleric can spend all of their spell points to wipe out some of the enemy group when just attacking is almost as fast and you don't have to wait a long time to get all of your spell points back? Your characters can level up, up to level 25, and have 100 times their health plus 50 health. At level 1 you have a maximum of 150 health, at level 25 and above you have 2550 health. With so much health you become nearly impossible to kill, even after many successive battles without any healing. And healing takes so long, just do yourself a favor and learn how to reach the healing fountain in the Dungeon of Fire. It's pretty easy to get to. If a character runs out of food, they'll take 5 damage each time they would have eaten, every 11 turns. It's just a minor irritation, but it kind of forces you to waste gold buying food. Food costs 1 gold each, and you'll go through a few thousand per character. This game did have a strange sort of permadeath to prevent you from just reloading. If a character dies, the game immediately saves them as dead to the disc. There aren't a lot of items in the game, especially not like there were in Ultima 2. There are a range of weapons and armor available, and this time around they're restricted by your class, not by your strength or dexterity. With bows and slings, you thankfully don't have to worry about ammo. Daggers are strange and then every character can use them and you can throw them, but you lose the dagger. Restocking daggers for your cleric or wizard requires buying one at a time, so you'll see this a lot. Not to mention that buying 99 daggers for 5 gold each comes out to 495 gold. There are also exotic weapons and armor that you need to find in the world. They're the only weapons and armor that do anything in the final castle and no the exotics are not ranged weapons. Spells are no longer items, but they will be again in Ultima 4 and 5. There is food which you can stock up to 9,999 of. It's basically a money sink that will start hurting you if you ignore it. There are one-use guild items, torches which give you light in the dungeons, gems which let you view an overhead map, 
powders which freeze time for a few moves, well, kind of, and keys which open any doors you come across. You can get horses which let you move twice for every movement the enemies and NPCs make, but don't decrease food consumption or mana regeneration. There are also ships which you can only get when a pirate ship attacks. Moving around on a ship is frustrating because the winds are constantly randomly changing between east, west, north, south, and calm, and you can't move a direction when the winds are coming from that direction or the winds are calm. This means that two out of five wind types do not allow you to move in a certain direction, so it becomes a problem quite regularly. The winds change out of sync with your movement, just like the whirlpool, so you just have to wait around to move when you can't. Lastly, there are four cards which are used to destroy Exodus. The main world is the only place random monsters spawn. In dungeons, you get random encounters but never see the monsters outside of battle, just like the Final Fantasy games do. Everywhere else only has set NPCs and monsters. When you get into a battle with a group of enemies, the game tells you what kind they are while it changes to a tactical combat screen. Most land-based enemies have three names they can have, so you don't always fight orcs. Instead, you fight orcs, goblins, or trolls. Or thieves, brigands, or cut purses. Or skeletons, zombies, or ghouls. Even the dragons become dragons, griffins, or wyverns. They don't really seem to make a difference, it just adds a bit of flavor to the game. There are between 1 and 8 monsters in a group. They always occupy the same spaces, though if there are less than 8, they are occupied randomly. Most NPCs in towns will only have a single entity in battle, though guards are always in groups of 8. The battles are simple. Every character takes a turn, in order. This is usually just moving or attacking, but you can cast spells, ready a different weapon, or simply pass if you want. Oddly enough, pressing V to turn sounds on or off skips the character's turn, just as looking at their stats does. Pressing invalid keys or hitting the edge of the battlefield doesn't skip your turn, at least. Most enemies only have a melee attack and will just head straight for your characters. Unlike your characters, they can move diagonally. They also have a bias towards going to the right, so if you want characters to level more, put them in character slots 2 or 4 so they're on the side most monsters shift to. A number of enemies have special abilities. Thieves can steal a small amount of gold as well as make an attack. Pinchers, Mana Wars, and Balrons can poison characters when they hit them. Wizards, Demons, Balrons, Sea Serpents, and Mana Wars can cast spells to hit a single character. And Dragons have a standard range attack, though they can fire it diagonally even though you can't. Also, Dragons and Pirate Ships can fire at you on whatever map they appear on, again allowing diagonal fire and traveling three spaces. This does quite a lot of damage if it hits you, around 50 to 100 to every character. The final enemy in the game isn't a giant demon like the box art would make you think, but a computer which you have to insert four special cards in the right order to destroy. The NPCs in town have three behavior types. They stand still, they move randomly, or they follow you. Merchants, for example, are always following you, but since the bars are in the way, they just seem to be attentive to you. NPCs are also allowed to move diagonally even though you can't. There is absolutely no pathfinding, so if something blocks an NPC that is following you, they will just run into it and stop. Most NPCs simply say a small amount of text when you transact with them. To learn how to play through and complete the game, you have to talk to various NPCs around the world. Most of the more important hits are on NPCs that are a bit out of the way. If you talk with a merchant, a new song and a set of menus shows up, allowing you to buy or sell things. Buying daggers, which you lose when you throw them, is annoying because you can only buy one at a time. And buying several thousand food at once takes a long time because you can only buy a maximum of 99 at a time. Most of the NPCs won't attack you, so if you end up having an NPC follow you, you can get stuck, and then you'll be forced to attack them to get by. However, some NPCs will attack you, generally in places you aren't supposed to be, like this thief guarding some treasure in the City of Grey. Lots of the NPCs in Exodus' castle attack you as well. While you're in town, if you get in a battle with an NPC, regardless of whether you attack them or they attack you, all of the guards in the city will change to follow you mode, and they will attack you when they get nearby. If you try to steal gold and get caught, the guards will also start chasing you down. Since they're rather difficult to fight in combat, this is generally devastating when you are low level. Some towns have many guards in them, but the City of Grey only has four guards, so it's an easy place to commit crimes. With characters with 50 or more decks and ranged weapons, the guards aren't really much of a problem. In some cases, like Devil Gulch, there are guards blocking your way. You can use the other command and bribe those guards by giving them 100 gold to make them disappear. There is only a single NPC you meet in a dungeon, and that is Father Time, who tells you the correct order to use the cards to defeat Exodus. The sound is very similar to the sound in Ultima 2, in that it's strange and not really a high point in the game. In fact, since sounds delay everything in the game, you usually want to play with the sound off by pressing the V key. Walking makes a clop sound, traveling on horseback makes a cloppity sound, casting a spell makes a jumble of noise followed by high-pitched sound, I suppose to sound like somebody's saying words to a spell, and there's a whack sound you just get used to when anything hurts a character. 
Firing a cannon from a ship just makes a generic sounding doo kind of sound, instead of the unique sound from Ultima 2. There's a weird sound when you enter battle, I have no idea what it's supposed to signify, but a similar sound occurs when you leave battle. It sounds an awful lot like the warbles at the beginning of Ultima 2. When your characters attack, it makes a similar swing sound to what Ultima 2 used, but it drops in pitch for each character, so when everybody attacks in a row, you get a nifty little effect. The whack sound happens if your attack hits an enemy and doesn't if it was a miss. If an enemy swings at you, it makes a sound just like enemy swinging at you in Ultima 2, and that is followed by no sound or a whack sound depending on whether or not it hit. Aside from a couple other sounds like a kind of beep when you do something invalid or the watch out when you steal something, there isn't much else to say about the sound. You probably just want to turn it off, play the game with less delays, and listen to the music anyways. Ultima 3 was the first game with a unique soundtrack that played through the entire game. Earlier games, such as Frogger, had soundtracks as well, but they used existing music repurposed for the game. For Ultima 3, the music was all created by Kenneth W. Arnold, who also moved on to create the music for Ultima 4 and Ultima 5. I grew up playing the Atari 8-bit version of this game, and it wasn't until far later that I found out that most of the music was modified to work on it. So I will also be comparing the Atari 8-bit music with other versions here a little bit. I remember enjoying the game music even as a kid. The Wanderer song has been one of my favorite pieces of music almost my entire life, which is why it was one of the very first things I translated to loot tablature for me to try learning how to play. It's going to be quite a while before I can play it very well, particularly since it has triplets, quarter notes, and eighth notes all playing at the same time in one part. On pretty much every other system, and when being converted to MIDI, it sounds quite a lot different. Quite some time ago, I made a mod out of the song. And as you heard in the very beginning of the video, I can at least play the very beginning of the song on my loop. I also rather like the Ambrosia theme, even though it's rather short and simple. And the Exodus music played in the final castle. Exodus's music showed up much later in Ultima Online when you visited Blackthorn's castle. The city music was used later in Ultima Online as one of the songs for Britain, the main city, so it may even sound familiar to some people who've never played Ultima 3. Here's the MIDI version from Ultima Online. And the Merchant Transaction music also made an appearance in Ultima Online, I think randomly while you were wandering. The dungeon music is... bizarre. It's certainly a bit creepy. On the Atari, it sounds like a bit of a mess due to the limited range of notes. Here's what it sounds like as a MIDI converted to piano. This is rather reminiscent of some of Chopin's work, such as his Nocturne No. 4. You can turn off the music by pressing Ctrl S and press it again to bring it back again. Like Ultima 2, the experience of opening Ultima 3's box was a unique and exciting one. Inside the box you got three different books, one for the game manual and a separate one for the wizard and cleric spells, as well as a cloth map and a couple cards. The books in the map were unique and memorable and did away with the complete goofiness of the Ultima 2 manuals. The manual had lots of unique artwork by Dennis Lubet, which resembles old-style wood engravings which were popular in the 1800s. 
This includes a view showing men and women of all the races, except there's no female dwarf for some reason, a unique image for every kind of shop, images for various NPCs, including one for Lord British, and an image for each monster type as well. It's one of the very first computer game manuals to have very much unique artwork like this, and is reminiscent of the Dungeons & Dragons manuals. The spellbooks had flavorful text about each spell, bordered with more artwork. The cleric spells came in a blue manual, while the wizard spells came in a yellow one. One of my earliest memories when I was only five or six years old was seeing my mother playing Ultima 3, walking into Britain. Nice music was playing, and the game immediately filled me with wonder and excitement because I'd never seen anything like it before. The multiple manuals and cloth map only added to the feeling that this was a serious product. We only had one computer, and my mother played quite a lot of the game first, but it got even better when I played it. Being able to keep a roster of characters with all the different races and classes was a lot of fun. For the time the game came out, this had a lot of data for every character with race, class, stats, magic points, health, experience, level, how many of each weapon and armor they have, what cards they have, and what marks they have. Ultima 3 led me to start making my own games at a very early age. I used a large chess set my parents got me, drew little houses, ships, and mountains on cardboard squares, and used graph paper to block off 8x8 areas of a map for loading the chessboard. I called this early game Scimitar Island, and placed an island shaped like a scimitar on it because I was totally original. For the game, I blended pieces here and there from a number of other games to make my first game. It had the tiles, cities, ships, and combat from Ultima 3, and an 8-space inventory like Bard's Tale, for example. I don't really remember how it all worked, or if even then I made up everything as I went along. However, one aspect of Ultima 3 left me wondering, why? I understood why you could banish undead with a simple spell, but why was there a free spell to destroy the orcs, trolls, and goblins? Just because they were created magic doesn't mean that they should easily be destroyed. How would they ever live if any novice could easily unmake them? This partly went away in Ultima 4, which actually changes completely to being a game based on morals called Virtues. And since I had these thoughts before Ultima 4 came out as a kid, the next game seemed to be answering at least some of my questions. But that's a different story. However, that thinking did eventually lead me to making my own role-playing games, which started out being a free-form version of Scimitar Island. I remember bringing the idea to school when I was in the sixth grade, and my friends all enjoyed playing it. Near the end of the school year, complete strangers were coming up to play Scimitar Island with me at school. Too bad I moved away after that school year because that was just starting to get interesting. In any case, I still do a lot of freeform role-playing, mostly with my wife these days, and I call the game Ambrosia, after the underworld of Ultima 3. I've probably spent somewhere around 10,000 hours playing Ambrosia, since I've played it for an average of an hour a day since the 6th grade, over 30 years ago. Sometimes when I got bored, I'd fire up a completed game of Ultima 3 and just kill things. Eventually I just gave up on picking up the chest because I had one of every class with maxed out stats and equipment, and aside from food, what did I need gold for anymore anyways? So the world started getting clogged more and more with chests. Loads of chests. So many chests. Peering in a gem, I could see a contagion of treasure creeping across the land, consuming the land, claiming everything for more treasure chests. Since monsters cannot travel over treasure chests, this makes much of the world a safe haven. Nothing spawns or can chase you down while you're surrounded by treasure chests. It certainly makes for some interesting screenshots and videos, but otherwise there isn't really much of a point, is there? I guess to just say I've well and truly defeated this game when so much gold is just lying about the entire world and I have no use for it whatsoever. I've played the dungeons enough that I don't use maps for them except on rare occasion, or even torches to see. For example, in the Time Awaits dungeon, there are large amounts of gold on levels 3 and 5 which you can access from level 4, which also conveniently has cure and healing fountains available. Looking at the map, you can see a path to get down there just fine. After memorizing this path, you can do it without light and get quite a lot of gold each time you head down, around 3,500 to 4,000 per run. On a completely different note, there is a city named Grey in the game. It's spelled with an E, the British way to spell Grey. Because of this, I learned to spell Grey with an E at a very early age, and since it wasn't technically an incorrect spelling, I've maintained that this is the best way to spell it. In case anyone was wondering why an American spells a single word the British way. I did also spell armor with a U before the R, but that died out since I'd have to make an exception for all sorts of other words I ended up learning without the U. This may be the first Ultima game that makes Lord British invincible in combat, but there's still a way around that, allowing you to defeat him. He only has infinite health while you're fighting him in combat. However, he acts like a guard, so if you cause trouble in his castle, he'll come after you. If you use the ship that is available in his castle and fire it at him, you can actually kill him. Except he somehow becomes plural when you shoot him. Imagine the invincible Lord British storming Exodus Castle. 
There would be no need for the adventurers, since he's invincible. In fact, why do we need to do anything at all when he could just easily get the Mark of Snakes and force himself, head to Ambrosia and get the cards, and then tough it out through Exodus? Lava wouldn't hurt him, so he wouldn't even need the Mark of Fire. Or is it impossible for him to get marks since he's invincible? If that's the case, okay, yeah, he can't get through the force fields in that castle and can't finish off Exodus. Without the Mark of Snakes, he couldn't even get past the giant serpent unless an enemy ship happened to spawn on the water there. The game does suffer from balancing issue, and that the game is rather difficult to begin with, and once you get your character's dexterities to 50 or more and their strength as high as you can, the toughest enemies in the game just get destroyed in combat. There are a few minor text bugs, such as pluralizing words wrong, like Lord British is when you kill him. If all of your characters die and you reload the game, it will sometimes show they have a G or good status, even though it should technically show a D for dead. If you get alternate music at a location, such as going into a shrine while you're in Ambrosia, which plays the fanfare music, and have a battle while that music is still playing, it will keep playing outside of battle until something else changes it. If you stop the music and then later restart it, it briefly plays the notes it left off on when you stopped it. This makes it so you can hear a single note of, say, the city music while you're on the main world map. In any case, this is a fun game to play even after the many times I've played it. If you can't tell, I've played the game many ways, tried many combinations and ways to play. I even had fun just doing silly things for recording, like playing a solo run with Lord British for the scenario I mentioned earlier, even though he of course wasn't really invincible. I'd give this game a 7 out of 10, and recommend playing through it to anybody that likes CRPGs. Since the Atari 8-bit version does not have Darden's Pit, the dungeon hiding in the mountains north of Britain, I specifically check each version of the game for it. I am curious if the Atari 8-bit version is the only one that doesn't have it. Hint, yes, it's the only one. Not that this dungeon has anything worthwhile, so its existence really doesn't matter. This is the original version for the Apple II, released by Origin Systems in 1983. It starts off detecting if you have a Mockingboard sound card, and if you do, it gives a special acknowledgement to Kenneth W. Arnold for the music in the game, which I thought was a nice touch. From here on out though, the game is nearly identical to the Atari 8-bit version. This is because they both use the same code base, the same graphics, and mostly the same music. I say mostly because a lot of the deeper tones in the original music were moved up an octave on the Atari 8-bit, so here it actually has a better range. Aside from there being more colors on screen, this really is the same game. Everything works the same as the Atari 8-bit version, beyond that intro acknowledgement for Kenneth W. Arnold. Still, it's nifty hearing the original versions of the music as they were intended to be. And yes, the original game has Darden's Pit. This is the Commodore 64 version, released by Origin Systems in 1983. It took some time to get this running because you need to use the exact disk drive speed, and even then, the intro doesn't always load properly, so there were a lot of reboots. It takes a very long time to load at exact drive speed, much slower than my real Atari 130XE does for the actual game. Just like the Apple II and Atari 8-bit versions, this supposedly used the same code base since all three run on nearly identical processors. The graphics are essentially the same, just with different colors. The intro song sounds alright, just a bit tinny, which continues through the game. I didn't play with the sounds on for long as normal. I did, however, immediately have the same problem with moving as I did in Ultima 2. I knew how to move west and north, and had to figure out east and south. Turns out north is shift 2, or the at sign, south is control P, west is control left bracket, and east is control right bracket. Unlike Ultima 2, the screen doesn't get all blurry every time I moved west, at least. Even if this game is using the same code as the Apple II and Atari 8-bit versions, it is incredibly slow. Combat was very slow. Just fighting a few orcs took way longer than it should have. It was so tedious to just wait while the shots ever so slowly fired across the screen, and everything slowly moved. And good lord, those loading times. Going into town takes over 32 seconds of loading time. Transacting with a merchant takes 4.5 seconds. Entering a dungeon only takes 31 seconds instead of 32. Dungeon walls are just white lines in this version. I wonder if they were supposed to artifact like the Atari 8-bit version. My favorite part of all of my experience with this version, right near the beginning of the game, a dragon spawned. My characters were still all level 1. I tried to get it stuck on this river, and it shot me. I tried to move down to get it into the position, but silly me, I pressed the wrong key, and ended up standing there right in the line of fire. And if you can't tell what happened, a character died. In fact, two died. The game is saving that they died, and it took a total of 48 seconds to save that two characters had died. Awful controls, slow gameplay, and tremendous loading times? I think I'll pass on this version. But hey, it has Darden's Pet! 
This is the MS-DOS version, released by Origin Systems in 1985. It was designed for a 4.7 MHz PC, so you have to make it run with a very low cycle count in DOSBox. I used 300 and it seemed to play about as expected. It used CGA graphics, so it only had black, white, magenta, and cyan for colors. They did what they could with that. With only internal speaker sound, they didn't use the music at all and only had the sound effects, which sounded somewhat like the original sounds. That intro sequence, though... Uh... You could just turn the sound off as normal with the V key once you were in the game, at least. It actually looks and plays alright, all things considered. The non-existent load times are nice compared to a lot of the other version. Combat is nice and quick, and everything seems to function as expected. Well, except that almost everything requires confirmation, so there's a lot more pressing enter while playing. And exiting from buying in a shop requires pressing escape for quit and then enter. This version also has Darden's Pit. This is the PC-88 version created by Thinking Rabbit and released in 1985. Apparently the disc I found for it online was mostly translated to English, but as you can see, some Kana still exists at times. This seems to largely be a direct port of the original version, but without music, with awful sounds, new graphics, and a keyboard handler that loves doubling key presses. The doubling key presses in particular was frustrating, especially since it made me often spin in circles in dungeons, making me get stuck for a while. The view was reduced in size and surrounded by an okay looking blue scroll. The view on the left has a bit of a squished look to it, however. The landscape is colorful, but the characters are all simply black and white. The dungeons look very much like the Atari or Apple II versions dungeons. In any case, due to the bad sound, but especially due to the double key presses, I didn't play this version for very long. It does have Darden's Pit, though. Here's the PC-98 version, created by Pony Canyon and Newtonia Planning, and was released in 1985. This version was hard to get running because you put in the first disc and this is what you see, a wall of text in Japanese. I sent a screenshot of this to my friend Chris, who knows a bit of Japanese, and a crude translation of the beginning of this text is, This disc is the master disc. Sometimes the first time you game, to begin or create the game, the user system disc is necessary. Aha! So I had to put in the user system disc first. More Japanese. Well, I know this game well enough, I should be able to force my way through this, right? So it turns out you also need to put the scenario disc into Drive 2. You get a pretty intro that looks like it's in 16 color 640x400 or so, with screechy sounds and a little dragon animation. The resolution alone must have been pretty impressive back in 1985. I fuddled my way through the character creation and made a team with stats in the right places. I think I got a ranger, fighter, lark, and a cleric. The tiled graphics look very Windows 3-ish, but that's an improvement from where we started at least. A little graphic appears next to each of your characters so you can tell who's who. And the game plays the original music, albeit rather fast. Well, in the dungeons it plays the Exodus theme instead of the dungeon music. However, right at the beginning I tried to view my characters and found out that the number keys across the top of my keyboard don't work. I don't know why they don't, since looking at the PC-98 keyboards there are number keys in the same place as our modern keyboards. The arrow keys also don't work, even though the keyboard should support them. Using the number pad works at least, though in the dungeons it says FORWARD without the first R. FORWARD THEN! Then I go by weapons and everything's in Japanese and uses numbers instead of letters. Oh dear. Well, it starts at zero, so sling, which is D, and A is hands, which isn't usable, so sling would be two, right? No. Okay, so does it let you buy hands? No, zero is cancel. Okay then. A sling is three then. Okay, how do I yes? Y does nothing. Okay, press left and then enter. Aha! This is gonna be an experimental lot version. And why do my characters only have 100 health? Oh boy. This wouldn't be quite so bad, except that the game is really unresponsive. I tried having the processor speed higher, but it made things worse. I had to press keys multiple times to get a response from the game, or hold them down for about a second each. When I went to cast a spell, I had the same problem as buying weapons. I thought zero was going to be cancel again, but it's not. It's for spell A, Pontori or Rapond. So when I went into the dungeon, instead of casting Lumine on my cleric, I went down a level to level 2, and didn't have the 20 mana necessary to go back up a level. I figured out how to properly cast light with my lark, and the graphics are impressive for the time period. After fighting some orcs, just a little more waiting to get to 20 magic, and then we get out and- oh, skeletons. Well, this should be easy. Huh, there are what looks like mummies with them. Pontori shows three of them die off immediately, and then I fight a sad, losing battle where every last character dies. I get a brief skull, and then reappear back at the beginning of the game because I never saved. Oops. At least it doesn't save your characters as dead when they die. You know, this was probably a nice version when it came out, but the keyboard delay bothered me so much that I didn't care about dying. This version does have Darden's Pit, at least. 
Oh, and it also supposedly came with a jigsaw puzzle for the map instead of a cloth one, which is pretty cool, I guess, though I'd rather just have a cloth map. This is the Atari ST version by Origin Systems and released in 1986. It uses brown borders and rather colorful graphics and a two-tone font that fit the game fairly well. The music sounds pleasant, but nothing spectacular on the ST. Starting the game up requires using the mouse to click the menu options. The first letters of the options don't work. Once you get into the game, the mouse cursor just hangs around and I tried to move it to the bottom right corner to get it out of the way, but it won't go down there. I'm only able to access the main view area and the stats region. Alright then. Ignoring the mouse, it controls just like the Atari 8-bit or Apple II version, so nothing special there. Viewing your stats gives you a full screen with sectioned off areas showing what your character has, which is fairly nice, except that you have to reach for the mouse to close it. Otherwise, it is so similar to the original versions of the game, there isn't a lot else to bring up about what's different. I did find some bugs with the mouse cursor, like if you move it around a bit over the character area, you start getting permanent... Christmas lights! Isn't that fun? Ignoring the mouse, though, it's a pretty decent port of the game. This version also has Darden's pet. Here is the Amiga version by Origin Systems and released in 1986. It looks exactly the same as the Atari ST version and was translated by the same person. Since both systems used a Motorola 68000 processor, it makes sense for them to have the same code base. The music here sounds a little better than on the ST, though I'm not sure if it's supposed to be an organ, harpsichord, or an accordion. Oh well. The sounds always play and I couldn't figure out how to turn them off. For the music, you can only turn the music down to one fourth volume, so it's always playing. The mouse is way too sensitive compared to the ST version, so I just used the pre-made team that came with my disc. The load times are pretty bad, taking about 21 seconds to get into a city and 20 to get into a dungeon. Even just hitting a fountain takes almost 2 seconds of loading to pull it up, and getting into battle also takes about 2 seconds. But at least the mouse glitches in the ST version are gone in this version. It also has Darden's Pit. There was an FM7 version created by StarCraft or maybe Pony Canyon and released in 1986, but I cannot find it anywhere. I did find the FM Towns version, which was released on CD in 1990, and I'll be discussing in a little while. This is the version you're seeing played right now. The FM7 version also supposedly came with a jigsaw puzzle map, just like the PC-98 version. There was a Macintosh version that Origin Systems released in 1986, but I cannot find the original anywhere. This is the only screenshot I could find of it, and it reminds me a lot of the Macintosh version of Ultima 2. I even downloaded a 30 gigabyte Mac archive from archive.org, hoping to find a copy of it, but it only had Lairware's version of the game. Lairware remade the game in 1993 in full color, so the original is almost impossible to find. I'll check out the Lairware version in a few. This is the NES version created by Newtopia Planning and Pony Canyon and released in 1987. It's all very cartoony and cutesy, but they replaced the great music from the original with this really awful sounding minimal effort music. This is probably the version more people have played than any other version due to it being on the NES, and I hate it. The view is full screen, which is interesting. It's very colorful and you could tell what everything is. There is a minimal amount of unique edge images used for where the water meets with the land. NPCs say different things from the original game. The controls feel good to play, and at least the game gives you menus to make buying, readying, and so on easy. You go into dungeons and cities simply by walking on them. There are just so many problems, though. You can't readily see your health. They have it coded already, so you can see everyone's health in combat and in dungeons, but outside, you have to not move for a bit for it to pop up. Walking through trees slows movement down for no apparent reason except to annoy you. Enemies outside only have a couple different graphics, one for easier enemies and one for harder enemies. I didn't play long enough to show them. Not recorded, but from memory I know that ships cannot fire, and there are additional things you need in the game like a flower and ambrosia. For some strange reason, your characters are all shown walking along in a conga line. Realize that entire cities take up one space, so your people are the distance of an entire city apart here. If an enemy gets near any of your people, even diagonally, you get attacked. The enemies on the overworld only move, I think, once for every four spaces you move, which just makes them really slow in comparison. But you don't see long chains of enemies moving about, it just shows one for a whole party while your whole party is shown. When enemies move, they also have a bit of lag, so it seems like they're moving between your moves. The enemies can even stack on top of each other. They're slow even in combat and don't seem to be able to move diagonally. And when I went into the Dungeon of Fire to cure poison, then came out, all of the enemies had mysteriously vanished. But the worst part is the awful music. I really cannot stand the music in this, especially the dungeon and battle music. For a game that started with great music, this part is such a letdown. Oh, but it does have Darden's Pit! Here is the MSX version, created by Pony Canyon, and released in 1987 or 1988. Sources don't really agree. 
However, it's nearly identical to the NES version, except as far as I know, it only came out in Japan. I can't read Japanese, so I didn't play it for very long to see if there were any real differences, but I didn't like the NES version at all and wasn't compelled to play this much beyond getting a simple recording of it. I got into one of the really slow battles with its awful music and was just done with it. I've seen enough. It's the NES version again. I get it. And of course, this version also includes Darden's Pet. There was supposedly a Sharp X1 version by Pony Canyon released in 1989, but after a lot of searching, I could not find it. Other than this box image, I only found a single screenshot for it. However, the screenshot looks like the PC-98 version's intro. As opposed to the later NES or MSX version's intro screen, though technically all of them were released by Pony Canyon, so I don't know. This is the FM Towns version created by Fujitsu and released in 1990. Some sources say this is the same as the FM7 version, and almost nothing mentions an FM10's release other than the fact that I found a CD image for it, so I'm not sure what happened here. This is so very similar to the PC-98 version which was made by Pony Canyon and is probably a port of that version, but I couldn't find a mention of Pony Canyon or Newtopia Planning anywhere while playing it. This version has completely unique music, but it's thankfully not awful like the NES version's music. It has a very similar intro to the PC-98 port, with a full-screen graphic, some decent music, and the animated dragon sequence, all in what looks like 16 color 640x480. Your characters all had little graphics next to them, which I suppose helps figure out who's who in battle. The tile graphics themselves are decent and colorful, though nothing spectacular. The dungeon graphics look pretty nice, albeit simplistic for the time the game came out. It used the same keys as the Atari version, with arrow keys to move. Almost everything felt about right to play with, though it was a tad sluggish at times. Readying weapons, talking to shopkeepers and the like had menus come up to tell you what to press, taking the place of the view screen, which I rather liked. Whenever you press the wrong button, a goofy what voice plays. Or maybe it should be what W-A-T. The sounds in battle are pretty silly, with the missing sound effect sounding a lot like eating or drinking in Eye of the Beholder. Like Ultima 5, it has different accomplice monsters such as the Brattles here with the Pinchers, and they have different graphics. When you hit, it actually tells you how much damage you do. When the AI goes, it takes a long time making up its mind and often doesn't even move. There is a big skull if you die, then the game reloads where you last saved. I already noticed a couple bugs or problems in that your ship sometimes vanishes when you go into a town, and if you choose to do an action like attack, you can't easily cancel. In fact, there are many differences I haven't listed, like Pontor giving 5 experience each kill instead of only 4, and Lava instantly killing you, and the rod's only doing 30 damage, but I could just keep going on. Oh yeah, it too has Darden's pet. This is the Lairware Macintosh version, originally released in 1993. It is still being updated and maintained. The Shareware version can be downloaded from their website for play on a modern Macintosh. The full version costs $25. I'm not sure what the restrictions are on the free version, as I hadn't run into any while I was playing for this recording. Get ready for an adventure, folks, because right off I have to say this is the most hilariously bad version of Ultima 3 I've played. It looks like someone tried, they really did, and they just didn't have the talent to modernize the game. Creating characters goes to a mouse-driven menu for some odd reason, when nothing else in the game uses the mouse. I don't even know why you have to choose your class before everything else. It could have just been one of the drop-downs in the character building screen. The updated graphics look very wonky and out of place, like Castle of the Winds almost, but with a little more color and two-frame animation like the original game. It makes me think of a bunch of paper cutouts that don't match with each other being placed together. Look at the water, the grass, and the road. Then the character's walking on top of it in Britain. That road tile looks really bad when combined with the rest of the graphics. Here's fighting a titan in a dungeon. Or a group of demons. That just doesn't work. It is nifty that there are portrait images for every character, though I didn't get to choose them. The two female characters I have look like their mouths are permanently open. Gasp! But zooming in on them, they really just have dark lips for one reason or another. The music sounds okay at times, and really bad at other times. In the main theme, it's obvious whatever sounds they are using for the music has a huge gap in the octaves. Listen to how the main theme's bass line jumps all over the place. The dungeon music is really weird sounding as well, though it always is. The game randomly pauses while playing for about half a second. It's not very noticeable in the video, but it was very annoying while playing. But what takes the cheese here is the sounds. This is what casting Sanctu, the healing spell, sounds like. 
that's healing. You know, to cure wounds on somebody. It sounds like we're summoning a demon. Not only that, but this long sound pauses the game the entire time it's going. Counting frames, it comes out to about 230 frames, or nearly four whole seconds. You probably cast Sync to more than all other spells combined. Good lord. Oh, and here's casting Lorem, the light spell. We get lightning from Pontori, the turn undead spell. It's just weird. Oh yeah, and the swipe sound from Loadrunner on the Atari ST is here as well. In fact, these goofy out-of-place sound effects really do remind me a lot of the digital sounds from Loadrunner on the ST, but for some odd reason, they included the unpleasant start battle and end battle sounds from the original game. At least you could press V like normal to turn the sounds off, and I recommend it, because then your spells are instantaneous. Oh, and it does a nifty thing while the sounds are off. It says hit when you fired an enemy and hit them. When you go Welcome into a to town, it gets shop. even sillier, Fire because the game uses a text-to-speech engine to have the NPCs quote-unquote talk, and turning off the sounds does not turn this off. Welcome to the weapons shop. But they also have different ways of talking. Fighters talk deeply. Thieves whisper. Axis lies beyond the silver sage. Guards sound like some normal guy. Good day. The guy running the pub sounds really deep. Dear friend, have a drink. It costs seven gold. And the gestures sound like they're too busy laughing, which is oddly appropriate and freaking creepy. <laughs> Lord British sounds so synthetic. It's silly. Welcome, my child. Now I can when you're in a dungeon, they use a simple stony texture for the walls and whatnot, but there is no shift or flipped images in the graphics when you move, an effect that helps a lot and was implemented in earlier games like Dungeon Master from 1987, so it's a little hard to tell you're moving. The fountains look pretty cool, though it is a still image of them. But unlike any other version of the game, the messages in the dungeons do not go away. Normally this wouldn't matter, but the game uses the thief text-to-speech to whisper to you. It's a bit eerie the first time, and quickly becomes comical. If you have to go through them multiple times or turn while you're on one, you hear it over and over again. Trap door. Trap door. If I'm leaving the dungeon, I don't need to hear Beware the fires of hell. a second time, just as I'm leaving. In any case, this is a very silly version of the game, but since there are plenty of other versions available, many for free, and I think all of the other versions are less than $25, I cannot recommend it. Even if it does have Darden's pet. This is the Game Boy Color fan-made version created by Sven Karlberg in 2001, and it starts off with a Daggerfall mage surrounded by a pair of rotating onks, which just prepared me for a cheesy game, but I was surprised that Sven actually managed to pull off a fairly competent port of Ultima 3 for the Game Boy. The music is fairly nice considering the hardware it's running on, it is the original music, not the awful NES music, and has a full range unlike the Atari version. The graphics are simple as to be expected, with colors for various terrain types, but none of the monsters or your characters are animated. After playing around with the game for a bit, I got used to the controls and then lost track of time playing because this port is very playable and feels very much like the original game. Almost everything is done with the A button to pull up menus and make selections, and B to pass. I think. I usually get my Nintendo controls backwards, so don't quote me on that. Anyways, in long menus like choosing an action, you can press to the side to go through more options, such as talking to NPCs in town. Combat is fairly fast if you're just attacking, like I normally do with ranged weapons. The dungeons look decent, even though it is odd requiring that you have light to use the fountains at all, but it does make a weird sort of sense. Otherwise, there's not a lot to say here since I didn't play through the entire game. I am surprised this is actually a good port, at least what I played of it. The docs that came with it say there's also more game to play after beating Exodus as well. Well done, Sven! It even has Darden's Pit! This is the Palm OS version by Paul Chandler and released in 2004. Apparently what I found was only the demo version. You can't actually buy the game anymore. It's not even on Handango as the game implies, though that was 14 years ago. This was a bit tricky to get working. I used the aptly named Palm OS Emulator. Loading the game with anything but a Palm V would crash the emulator, but with version 3.5 of the BIOS and Palm V, it worked just fine. 
For part of the video, I had the mouse on so you could see where I was clicking, but it looked a little odd at the same time. There's no sound at all. When creating your characters, the screen didn't refresh particularly well. You can see me setting dexterity to 20, but my available points doesn't budge. After setting intelligence and specifically clicking on the number, it then works properly. The graphics aren't bad, they look reminiscent of the VGA version of Ultima 3, sort of. But what the heck is going on with that water? A lot of the other images are clearly from Ultima 5, such as the mountains and the insides of the dungeons. Figuring out how to work this was a bit tricky. Using the arrow keys, I could move just fine. Bumping into dungeons and cities enters them, and bumping into NPCs talks to them. Pressing the A, B, C, D, E menu icon brought up menus for equipping the characters, so I got everybody a ranged weapon. The dungeons are overhead when you can actually see, though true to the original game, the Lauren spell has no lasting power whatsoever. And what the heck are these monsters? They look like they're taken from Ultima 5 as well. There are no snakes or bats or bugs in the original Ultima 3. Everything is at least animated separately, however. The battles themselves... are a mess. It seems you alternate between what target you want to attack and press the palm draw pad to fire, but it was hard to tell what was going on at all. You can't see your health, so you don't know how well you're doing, and when you complete a battle, simply walking into a chest just gets it, so you get hit by the traps. The game does have a par unum, the spell to unlock chests, but I have no idea how you'd use it. This is a very strange port that feels incomplete. I really don't recommend it. Not that you could get the full version of it anymore anyways. But at least it has Darden's Pit! This is the alpha of a Sega Master System version that was being created by a Harold Oop on the SMS Power forums in 2006. It was never completed, so what you see is, so far as I can tell, all there is to it. There's no sound, the graphics are similar to Ultima 5's, but it has a nifty looking border around the main screen. You can walk through anything, press start to enter Lord British's castle, and press A to talk to NPCs you're standing on, and that's about it. Not a bad start, but not really much to it either. This version even had Darden's Pit, at least on the overworld map. This is the enhanced MS-DOS version. Michael Maggio, also known as the Voyager Dragon, made mods for Ultima 3 to bring it more up to modern DOS standards. He added support for MIDI, bringing the great original music back, as well as EGA and even VGA graphics. I played version 3.2, which came out in 2016. A link to his version is included in the description. Oddly enough, he didn't put his name into the copyright in the game, just left it as is. This version takes a lot of graphics from Ultima 5, such as the mountains, guards, and zorns. Pinchers don't look like pinchers anymore. It uses other graphics I don't recognize, like most of the characters, and makes the game far more presentable. The control and gameplay are the same as the regular MS-DOS version, even the annoying need to press enter for a lot of things. However, you can have any speed processor and the game compensates for it. This turns out to be a nice version of the game to play, all things considered. The graphics are pretty nice where they're updated, and it really stands out where they're not, such as the dragon in the intro and the dungeon graphics. The dungeon graphics are actually probably generated by drawing code as opposed to using images, so they would be a little more complicated to replace. I rather like this version, though a couple of the songs, like the Merchant Transaction song, sound a bit wonky, especially when switching back and forth with the city music. The instant loading and saving are really nice, though. Thank goodness for hard drives. If you want to play, I recommend getting this version and playing it on good old DOSBox. This version even has Darden's Pit. The game actually gave me a nice challenge while I was testing it by making me face eight pinchers to fight with my fledgling team. I barely won the battle with three poison characters and had to carefully heal the right ones to keep them alive since they were constantly taking damage as I led the party to the Dungeon of Fire. We barely made it. I then subsequently cured my team, ran down to the fountain on level 2 and healed up. Well, yes, I didn't have light. Why would I need light when the cure fountain is 2 east, 3 south from the entrance, just goes south 5 more east, 8 south 2 descend, west once, north twice, east once, north 3 times, east twice, and north once, and you're at the healing fountain. Simply retrace your steps to get out. Piece of cake. I had an alpha of a remake I was making back in 1995 or so, but after many hours of searching, I simply could not find it. I remember making the tiles and how coding for the dark regions was a little tricky at first. The edges were all smoothed out, and I used simple proximity tests to support transition tiles so it looks somewhat like Master of Magic. It was pretty nice looking for a 256 color VGA game made by a teenager. Oh well. Probably lost in a hard drive crash back in the day or something. Meh.
Lots of places online quote that the game sold 120,000 copies without any meaningful information attached to that number. Did the original Apple II version sell that many copies? Did every version made by 1985 sell that many copies combined? Is that the grand total of all versions ever sold? None of the sources I found were very clear about that. The roster system used in Ultima 3 was inspired by the roster in the Wizardry games. They function very similarly. None of the future Ultima games use such a system as you only create your main character in them, and anybody that joins you is already created in the game world. Some religious fundamentalists saw the demon figure on the game box and protested against Ultima 3. It's encouraging children to start Satan worshipping, was the claim, which is just ridiculous. It's an enemy to defeat, not an evil entity to worship. Ultima 3 is often said to be the conceptual foundation used for a lot of later games, such as Dragon Warrior, Dragon Quest, and Final Fantasy, right down to largely having the same class selections. Other Ultima staples since even Ultima 1, such as having a separate map for the overworld and cities, was also used by Seven Cities of Gold, which came out just a year later. The basic look of the world was still used much later with very different games like Civilization, heck, even up to Civilization 3, and Master of Magic. Master of Magic even had a separate tactical combat screen rather reminiscent of Ultima 3 through Ultima 5. Kenneth W. Arnold created the wonderful music in Ultima 3, Ultima 4, and Ultima 5, with the exception of Stones, which started in Ultima 4, which was created by the real-life ILO, David R. Watson. Many of these songs are so memorable and nostalgic for me and many other people that have enjoyed the Ultima series. In the 80s, I kept recordings of a lot of the music on tape, especially the Ultima 3 Soceria Wanderer theme and the Ultima 5 theme song, just so I could listen to them more often. After Ultima 5, Kenneth left Origin Systems, and he has worked as an engineer for Dell Compaq, HP, NVIDIA, Hewlett Packard, and currently works at Nomadic. It appears he never did music again, which truly is a shame. And no, he has nothing to do with the Kenneth Arnold known for sighting a UFO back in 1947. Dennis Lubet, who made the cover art and all of the artwork in the manual, continued to make artwork for the Ultima games. These are all great and very memorable box covers. In fact, he ended up doing the artwork for almost all of the Origin System boxes and manuals, such as Wing Commander and Wing Commander 2, Ogre, Auto Duel, and Strike Commander. He didn't do the box art for Ultima 7, though, well, except it turns out he actually did release a concept cover for it in 2016 for his Patreon patrons, and later put it on his DeviantArt page. He's also worked for King's Isle Entertainment, Steve Jackson Games, Hero Games, and others, such as doing the artwork for Arx Fatalis. He co-founded Iron Will Games and Pixel Mind Games. He's still an active artist, running a Patreon for fans of his artwork, while creating digital images, artwork, 3D models, and even some 3D printing. I've provided links to his website and DeviantArt page, which you should definitely check out because his art is awesome. I went into a lot of detail on the Ultima series and Lord British specifically in my Ultima 2 video, so I won't go through that again here. However, there's a lot more to Origin Systems than just the Ultima series. They also created the Wing Commander series, which includes one of my favorite DOS games, Wing Commander Privateer, as well as many individual games such as Auto Duel, Ogre, and Bioforge, and they published a few other games such as Shadowcaster and System Shock. From what I can tell, before their acquisition by Electronic Arts and subsequent closure, it was a great company to work for and had a lot of creative people working for it. I can only account for one personally, David Shapiro, whom I met in San Jose a couple of times at a convention where he played a few games of Magic the Gathering with us. He's very easygoing and great to talk to about the good old DOS games. He's also known as Dr. Cat or Faloran, and not only worked on Ultima 5 and Ultima 6, but also later released for Cadia, an online graphical chat released in early 1997 that is still running today and where I met my wife back in 2001. Those were the days.